Welcome to Sunday School. I'm on time for a change. I want to talk about stories this morning. Sunday School stories. Uh, have you ever tried to at least write uh, an outline of your own biography, your autobiography? Have you ever have you ever attempted it? Have you ever fantasized? Have you ever w pondered the possibility of actually s sitting down and uh, writing your own biography? Well, whether you like it or not, you're doing it. You're either doing it well or you're doing it poorly. You know, it's often said, or the the the, the rumor is, as uh, uh, you're dying, or when people are dying, they say, "I saw my entire life flash before my eyes in a in an instant." Now, that's a pretty universal phenomenon. And then they come back to life, but they say, "I saw my whole life pass before me." That's your biography. Now, objective reality being what it is and is not, your your view of of your own uh, uh, life is totally unique and totally your own. And uh, somebody else, even uh, somebody very close to you, a family member or a spouse or something, uh, that's been with you through all of the years that you might describe in a in an autobiography would be looking at things a whole lot differently so uh, at my age i've i've uh, gone through uh, quite a few adventures of uh, of minor minor historic uh, uh, interest and people always say well what's the real story of Grady McMurtry, or what's the real story of, uh, you know. Well, I can tell you what my observation was, and from my point of vent, that is Lon Milo to get put in that in that position. But I can't say, and this is history, and anybody else's point of view, especially where I'm concerned, and Duquette was the biggest asshole in the, <laughs> He fucked it all up, you know. I won't argue with you, you know. That's your reality, that's your biography. But the story of your own existence, I believe, is, is important for you to recognize and to formulate and to, as the years go by, uh, 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 mutate and enlarge, uh, whether or not it has all that to do with uh, objective reality as if a camera was going through, a movie camera was going through the whole uh, event would uh, uh, jive with your perception of, of those circumstances. Doesn't matter. You are who you are because of your story. When I, I was so bored in Nebraska that uh, walking to school, I would, uh, I would pretend I was in a movie because I love movies. I went to movies all the time. I was pre pretending I was in a movie and I was the main character and I was the main character is walking to school and he looks up and he sees the icicles hanging from the hundred year old carriage house in the alley I'm walking down and and uh, everything uh, took on interesting dimensions in this in the same way that uh, uh, scenes in a Bergman film will just linger on on the dotted Swiss curtains of a 
house just blowing in the wind uh, and it gathers your that's important it's it's a point event in space-time and I'm the observer that's why magicians are encouraged almost demanded to start keeping a diary now a magician keeps a diary for uh, um, uh, many other purposes besides uh, uh, a biography but Crowley actually says one of the very first things that you put in your magical diary is your own story your own biography to give you some glimpse of the events that create the momentum and the trajectory of your incarnation uh, everything that has brought to you to this point of where I'm a magician now this is what brought me to begin the great work so I encourage you I encourage you to write your own biography think about it and then write it but if you're only going to do one of those things write it and think about it later at the beginning of uh, my second sort of biographical book uh, uh, low magic uh, I, I just wrote a, a one-page prologue here uh, uh, called stories and there's a quote from Washington Irving who uh, uh, Rip Van Winkle and and uh, a wonderful wonderful American storyteller I always, I'm always at a loss at how much to believe of my own stories that's what he said next to silence stories are the most divine form of communication stories are alive stories are holy stories are gods that create universes and the creatures and characters that populate them stories bring to life all the triumphs and tragedies imagination and experience can summon to the mind stories speak directly to our souls stories are magic As I begin the seventh decade of my life, and now as I'm in my eighth decade of my life, I find myself more inclined to listen to a story than to study a text or reflect on an argument. I'm more inclined to tell a story than to presume to teach a lesson or offer advice. Perhaps it's because as we grow older, we have more stories to tell. An experience and wisdom conspire to add dimension texture and perspective to the lengthening register of our memories now you know I've shared this with you before but stories your own mythology represents the main character in your initiatory life in your initiatory experience and you better at least have a head start a jump start if you will on who that character is and the best way to do it and try to instead of trying to analyze your, your yourself just tell the freaking story as you recall that it, it unfolded to you at the time worry about the the moral of the story later in fact you may never get to the moral of the story i guess that's what uh, one of the advantages of my own story uh, one of the advantages of appreciation of motion pictures of plays uh, 
Constance is a big book reader, okay? Uh, I, I would rather see the story unfold visually. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm lazy or that's just the way my, my brain operates better. I like to see the mythology. I can read about myths and, and, and things, but to see it unfold in the magic of, uh, of theater and the magic of cinema and uh, when I mentioned Bergman or Fellini or something like that, it's because I saw <laughs> Bergman and, and Fellini. How it got to the Little Columbus Theater, I, I don't know. I think they were cheap. That, that's why. But uh, uh, I didn't analyze it. I, I didn't go... Why is Julietta seeing the ghost of her grandfather on the beach with all these really beautiful women and this goofy music and and uh, and spirits and I didn't stop to analyze that stuff. I just absorbed the story. I'm still working on well, what the hell. Did <laughs> did, did any of that mean? But I tell you, for a 11, 12 year old old kid, Juliet of the Spirits, <laughs> or, or the Seventh Seal, okay, uh, had a profound spiritual uh, effect on it, and it made me appreciate my own existence my own role as the main character in my own play. Okay. 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago today, almost, 20 years ago next month, uh, I was asked to write a, a story for, uh, for Fate magazine. Okay. Now I've, talk about your own stories. My, my aunt ran a, uh, a residential beauty shop in Belmont Shores, uh, California. I can still smell the permanent wave chemicals and her tobacco. And, uh, but anyway, she, she had a little basket. Uh, this was before I could even walk. So we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, well, I couldn't walk for a long time because of my hip condition. But I'd crawl around her floor, and she had a magazine rack uh, by her chair and a pedestal ashtray that she had. And uh, there were little copies of a little magazine, Fate magazine. And it had flying saucers and stuff on it. And I thought, ooh, how cool, how cool Aunt, Aunt Vina is, you know. Uh, and crumpled up packages of, of cool cigarettes. Uh, that's why she died when she, but anyway, that's other stories. Uh, my, my good friend, uh, Donald Michael Craig, uh, was editor, had become editor of uh, Fate Magazine at the, at the time, we're talking 20 years ago. And uh, uh, he said uh, he wanted me to, to, to write an article on the terrors of the threshold and astral projection. It needed an astral projection story. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm not a clinical anything. And, uh, uh, but I do have stories, stories of my own experience biographical stories and that's how I went about writing a story in the October 2004 edition of Fate magazine and uh, I'm not going to read it I've read it to you bef uh, before uh, but here's how my story started terrors of the threshold astral projection in the Egyptian book of the dead Sounds like it's going to be, oh, 
This could be dry, okay? We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. That's uh, St. Shakespeare <laughs> from The Tempest, okay? It is a magician uh, story. Zombies in the Basement. How's, how's that as an opener? It was one of those hot, humid summer nights for which Nebraska is notorious. I love Sam Spade and Dashiell Hammett. Can you, <laughs> can you see Humphrey Bogart in this? It was one of those hot, humid summers for which Nebraska is notorious. Sundown brought little relief. I was 15 years old and uncomfortable enough in my teenage body as it was. But that night the sweltering heat made it impossible to sleep. I grabbed my pillow and trudged down to the basement where it was a few degrees cooler. When I was younger, I'd been afraid of the basement, its darkness and strange, earthy smells. But now I welcomed its musty promise of cool relief. I tossed and turned on the pull-out bed and finally found an almost comfortable position, my arm dangling over the edge of the mattress, my hand resting on the cool cement floor. I had just drifted into a sweaty half-sleep when I became aware of an irritating noise that sounded like the random slaps of a brush on a loosely set snare drum. More annoyed than frightened, I got up and made my groggy way through the darkness to the foot of the stairs. There. Huddled on the steps were people, horrible-looking people, zombies. There must have been a dozen of them, packed together as if they were hiding. I was terrified, but they seemed oblivious to my presence. Indeed, they seemed oblivious to each other. I started to shout at them, get the hell out of here, but my vocal cords were paralyzed. <laughs> I couldn't utter a word. I tried again, but could only push out a terrified howl. I was petrified with fear. The ghastly mob started to move down the stairs as if gravity was sucking them down the stairs like a lazy tide of unclean ooze. I panicked at the thought of being cornered in the basement by this wave of monsters. I knew I had to somehow fight my way through them to get upstairs to safety. The pit of my stomach tingled as I gathered every ounce of energy and courage I could, I felt I could fly. I, I was actually thrilled as I pushed my way up the stairs. The zombies didn't make it easy. They, they attached themselves to me as if to feed on my energy. Their bodies were cold and foul like pale, bloated corpses that had been in stagnant water for a long time. They touched me obscenely from head to foot, clawing away pieces of my flesh as I struggled up the steps. Still, I pushed what was left of me up the steps until I reached the landing. I had finally made it. Something impelled me to, to, to look out the window of the door to the backyard. I saw a large swimming pool. I thought, oh, I'd love to take a swim right now and wash this zombie scum off me. Wait a minute. 
we don't have a swimming pool in the backyard. Not only that, there's no window in the back door. Only then did it occur to me that this was a dream. But this was more than a dream. I looked down at my hands and saw the familiar lines in my palms. If this was a dream, I, I wanted to wake up. I tried to wake myself up, but I couldn't. The only thing I could think of to do was go back to bed and wake myself up. Instantly, I found myself in my own bedroom, flat on my back, in bed, staring up at the ceiling. Still, I couldn't wake up. Only then did I remember I wasn't in the bedroom. I was asleep downstairs in the basement. Suddenly, my right hand felt cold and clammy. Then the back of my neck tingled so much it actually hurt. Somewhere I opened an eye and saw my own arm dangling over the pull-out bed in the basement, my hand still touching the cool cement floor. And for a moment, I could also see my bedroom ceiling from the point of my other body. Upstairs. My basement body forced an open another eye, and I felt like I had been punched in the stomach. I sat straight up as if to catch myself. I looked around at the dark basement and amazed at how light the darkness appeared. I then let out an embarrassing, let out an embarrassing like chuckle as if I just witnessed myself do, do something stupid. It was the last time I would sleep in the basement. Now, I take that story, and uh, that's a true story, as, as best I could uh, uh, recall it, and then blow the narrative through the trumpeted voice of uh, Sam Spade, uh, but then I go on to use the landmarks of that story to explain what I, I would later uh, be revealed to me, I guess, or later I would discover, would be the, uh, the very technical landmarks of consciousness associated with experiences uh, like that. And, uh, and then later uh, project that into the, the Kabbalistic uh, realities of the different, different layers of consciousness associated with magic and things like that. But my point is, it was the story. I started with the story. I understood the mechanisms of, of magic through the story instead of reading the operating manual of magical textbooks. Anyway, if uh, you get nothing else out of uh, this morning's Sunday School, it's that I'm encouraging you to, number one, start taking your own story seriously. The comedy, the drama, the tragedy, the romance. It's your story. And it's just important. No, it's more important than any other story you're going to encounter in this incarnation. That's Sunday School for the morning. We'll see you tomorrow for the Order of Monday morning. Until then, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will.